be super top notch. This is somewhat less than ideal technology setup in this classroom. That's not, you know, it's not my classroom. I'm not all that used to it. Um, but it will have at least audio and any of the board work that I do. So you'll be able to come go back and double check things. Um, probably what will be more useful will be the slides that PD that are going to be available. And you just go to the, the buttons below on the Canvas homepage that say week one, week two, week three. Um, every single lecture, I'll post the, the lectures as a PDF there. And so if you ever miss a day, that's probably the spot to go to. And then, you know, kind of refer to the recordings from there. Like, oh, okay, I don't understand what he was trying to get at at this slide. So then try and go find that part in the recording where I was talking about that. Um, I don't really expect anybody's gonna wanna sit and watch um, 90 minutes of the whiteboard. Sometimes on, depending on the lecture, might be mostly empty whiteboard with just my voice talking if we're doing a lot of the stuff on the slides. So I get that, um, but just it's kind of, both of those tools are there for you if you do need um, any additional help there. All right, so we ended talking about adding and subtracting in uncertainty. Um, where we want to start for the day, yeah. So this is just working through that, that example that we ended with where we were talking about, okay, if we have 4.56, where is the uncertainty on 4.56? It's plus or minus what? And in the un, we'd say the uncertainty is in the hundredths place. We'd say it's plus or minus 0.01. Those both mean the same thing. So, and if we're adding these together, if our uncertainty on 3.0 is in the, the tenths place, right? So, and again, our calculator answer is going to give us this. If we want to know where to round, we just have to remember we have to keep the same uncertainty as the largest uncertainty from either of the numbers we're adding. Or if there's more than two, you same same rule applies. Doesn't matter how many numbers we're adding or subtracting, we're going to keep this largest uncertainty is going to be the uncertainty on our answer. Um, it's been a really long time since I had a, a class where we um, where I was in a class where we were taught order of operations. Um, so everybody, when you learned order operations, PEMDAS, we talked about how addition and subtraction are really the same operation, right? Um, because subtraction is really just adding a negative number, right? So subtraction and addition are both going to have the same rule. Um, anytime you're doing adding or subtracting or both, it's that same rule. So our final answer here would be 7.6. We would round the five up. To give us this, our final answer. All right, easy enough, right? Yeah. Oh, my formatting got a little messed up on these. So here's some more practice problems. Just four of them, really quick. Grab your calculator or do them in your head if you like. Try and do the math, that's the easy part, and then practice rounding to the right spot.
So for the first one, this will happen a lot of the time if we're using numbers we measured ourselves, and we use the same you know, tape measure or ruler to measure both of them, they should have the same uncertainty if we use the same tool to measure, right? So we're plus or minus 0 0.01, plus or minus 0 0.01. So our answer should be plus or minus 0 0.01. Um, this also happens pretty commonly too. If you have two numbers that are very different in size, a lot of times you'll measure them with a different instrument, right? If you're filling up a, um, with a lot of my examples don't necessarily apply to this, to this crowd because a lot of my measuring numbers and measuring volumes examples come from brewing beer. Um, but and when you're brewing beer, you have to fill up a five gallon or seven gallon bucket all the time and you measure it and say, oh, okay, that's six, six point oh gallons. It's about, you know, plus or minus a tenth of a gallon. And then go and take away, you know, scoop out a smaller amount with something. So I'm measuring the six gallons in a big bucket. And then I'm going to take out 0.08 gallons, you know, a couple cups or something like that using maybe just a measuring cup. So if I measure, if I'm, if I have two very different volumes or two di very different um, quantities, then a lot of times they will be measured with different um, vessels. So 6.0 minus 0 0.08. Our uncertainty here is 0 0.1 gallons, right? What's our uncertainty here? 0 0.01 gallons. So our answer should be plus or minus 0 0.1. So our calculator answer would be 5.92 gallons. We're just going to round that to the nearest tenth. So it'd be 5.9. Um, if you're doing subtraction or addition and you actually take the time to set it up like this vertically, it's actually really easy to just say, okay, well, this has the fewest digits in it. So I'm just, even before you plug it into your calculator, you can actually do the rounding beforehand and just say, oh, I know this is plus or minus 0 0.1. Therefore, my answer is going to be plus or minus 0 0.1. I'm just going to round this to the closest 0 0.1 right now. So you could, you can just do that. And now it's really obvious, right? So there are some advantages still in setting it up the, the way you were taught in grade school for, for doing your subtraction. You can see where you're going to be doing your rounding pretty easily that way. Of course, nobody wants to do extra writing. So most people are just gonna plug it straight into their calculator without rewriting it. And that's fine too, as long as you could remember your rules. All right, how about 12 minutes plus 0.19 minutes? What's the uncertainty on 12 minutes? Plus or minus a minute, right? And again, with time, this is actually something that this makes a whole lot of intuitive sense. We do this all the time with time. If I say it takes 12 minutes for me to get here from, from LTCC, that's not exactly 12 minutes, and I'm probably not going to go more accurate than that. Plus or minus a minute is pretty good for estimating how long it takes something to drive around town, right? And then let's say I got stopped at a traffic light and it added point, point 0.19 minutes. I took out my stopwatch and I measured just how long that red light made me wait. And it was point 0.19 minutes, which can anybody ballpark that in seconds? Can you do that in your head? A tw point, so a fifth of a bit, 12 seconds, I think. Right around there, it's right around a fifth of a minute, a fifth of a, 10% of a minute is six seconds. So reasonable numbers for our stoplight analogy. Does that actually change my overall estimate for my time? No, because when I plug this into the calculator, I'll get sure I'll, it'll say 12.19 minutes. But then we have to round to the nearest minute anyway. So Which 
again, kind of makes sense. Sometimes when you're adding a really small number to a big number, especially if you have a fair bit of uncertainty on your big number, your result doesn't actually change. Right? And that's okay. That's it's supposed to be like that. All right, easy enough, right? The trick with with these rules for rounding is, is not that either of these sets of rules you're gonna learn today are hard, it's that you have to remember which one to use under which circumstances. And sometimes you have to switch back and forth between the two rules for rounding. If you have to do some addition or subtraction, and then you have to take that answer and do multiplication or division with it, you have to use different rounding rules for different steps in the problem. And keeping all that straight is actually the trick. It's not actually that hard on its own. So in order to, to talk about multiplication and division, we are not just gonna talk about uncertainty. We're gonna talk about another way of estimating how good a measurement is, which we call significant figures um, or significant digits. Usually I wind up just abbreviating it to sig figs. So when you see me say, hear me say sig figs, I mean significant digits, significant figures. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and say right off the bat that sig figs and rounding in general is the single most common thing that you will be marked down for in this class. Typically, it's not a, a really big penalty, um, but I want to be reminding you, oh, you should have been rounding here. You messed up your rounding there. You've measured your number wrong here. It's always the, the most common error people make in this class, in any of my classes, frankly. So um, don't take it personally. Um, it's just something that you're going to have to be constantly working at, trying to remember how to get better at it drill it into your brain until you can't possibly miss it anymore. Um, so sig figs, if we're counting, so knowing, knowing where the uncertainty is, is all well and good. But sometimes we wanna know how, how much trouble somebody went to to measure a number. And some, we can't necessarily tell that just by where the uncertainty is. But the number of significant figures in a number is actually a pretty good indication of how accurate that number is. Um, and so our rules for sig figs are basically, a sig fig is basically just a number. It's a measured number. Um, and so how, when you're, go back to this, this number we had before. When, we're, when we have a measured number, the number of digits that we went to the trouble of measuring is how many sig figs we have. So the number one rule for sig figs is if you're counting how many sig figs a number has, it's just how many digits were written down, right? Especially if it's non-zero. If it's non-zero, it's always a significant figure. It's always means that it was measured. You don't have a digit written down that was if it wasn't measured. Um, if you have a number Sometimes you can have a measured number that's not um, a non-zero digit. So for instance, if you have a zero at the end of a decimal, we saw that a little bit before, right? When we had 3.0, that point zero was measured, even though it's not gonna affect our calculation. We went to the trouble of measuring it, so it's significant. And sometimes we'll have a zero in the middle of two non-zero numbers. Well, that's a measured digit as well, right? So these first three are basically our rules for determining, okay, this is how we can look at a number that's written down and know whether that's a measured or not. So 5.13 is three sig figs. 5.310 is four sig figs. 4.0, oh, sorry, 5.04 is three sig figs. And we'll get to why this is, is relevant here in a minute. Um, but we'll start by just getting, getting the hang of being able to count these. And then number four is just, if you bother to write it down in scientific notation, 
in the coefficient of a, of a scientific notation number, then by definition, it's a sig fig. You don't write down numbers in the coefficient of, of a scientific notation unless it's a sig fig. So, you know, 1.21 times 10 to the fourth. How many sig figs is that? Three. One, two, one. Does the four count? It's a non-zero digit. Why not? It's basically just how many decimal places, how many spots you have to move the decimal place, right? So in other words, it's not really a measured number. It's just keeping track of where your decimal place is supposed to go. So that doesn't count. The 10 doesn't count. The coefficient counts. This doesn't count as a measured number because if we could be off by a, a digit here, that's an entire factor of 10 we could be off, right? If, we're, if we could be off by an entire factor of 10, why are we even bothering writing down these numbers? Just say it's 10,000. It's somewhere between 1,000 and 100,000. That's if we're plus or minus one in this spot in the power, that's really what we're saying. Right? It could be anything from 10 to the three to 10 to the five. So we won't even bother to write this down. We don't usually deal with numbers like that in this class. We'll do, we'll do some log raw, blah, 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 some logarithmic. Um, functions where we can wind up being off by an entire digit here, but we know it ahead of time and we just don't bother with the coefficients for the most part in cases like that. Anybody know of any, any units that work on a log scale? Ten and what? Ten and one. What about it? Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, so... Basically, what a log scale is, is every time you go up one unit, your um, the magnitude that you're measuring goes up by a factor of 10. So pH is the classic example. If you have a pH of 7 and it goes to a pH of 6, a pH, something with a pH of 6 is 10 times more acidic than pH of 7. And you went from 7 to 5 then it's, that's a hundred times more acidic. From seven to four is a thousand times more acidic, right? So log scales show up in chemistry because we deal with some really, really big and really, really small numbers. And we're dealing with really, really big and really, really small numbers. Sometimes we need to be able to cover really broad range um, of, of possible values. All right. So let's practice doing this uncertainty and counting sig figs. So 48 meters per second is a pretty decent major league fastball. If you want a good rule of thumb for converting between meters per second and miles per hour, you take meters per second and double it, that's about miles per hour, plus or minus five, five or so. So 48 meters per second, 90 some odd miles per hour. How many, how many sig figs in 48 meters per second? Two, what's the uncertainty? Plus or minus one, or you could say the uncertainty is in the one's place. How about the speed of sound? 343.29 meters per second at sea level. Five sig figs, and where's the uncertainty? Hundreds, hundreds of a meter per second. And how about 3.00 times 10 to the eight? Three sig figs, where is the uncertainty? Kind of. Scientific notation makes it a little bit tricky to determine where the uncertainty is. Because it's not really it's not 0 0.01 or plus or minus 0 0.01 meters per second, is it? 
it's plus or minus 0 0.01 times 10 to the 8. So and 0 0.01 times 10 to the 8 could be simplified as what? How do we rewrite that? Take this number and multiply by by one with eight zeros after, right? Or multiplying by something by 0 0.01 is the same as dividing by what? 100. If we take this number and divide by 100, what do we get? 10 to the sixth. So you can say plus or minus 0 0.01 times 10 to the eight or you could say plus or minus 10 to the sixth. In other words, 3.00 times 10 to the eight plus or minus what's 10 to the sixth in terms of everyday numbers. What's 10 to the three? A thousand, so what's 10 to the six? A million. So plus or minus a million meters per second. Doesn't seem all that accurate, right? You'd be off by a million meters per second. But that's still only 1% of the actual, less than about a third of a percent of the actual number, right? Three, turns out light moves pretty fast. All right, so all that just to say, when you're reporting where the uncertainty is with scientific notation, be careful. You can either put it in, leave it that way. Like the one I left written there is totally fine. That's the way to do it. That's, you don't have to do any mental arithmetic or anything. You can't trip yourself up real if you do it that way. Um, how do we feel about scientific notation in general? Pretty okay. Maybe, maybe not. Um, well, either way, we can still do some practice with it just because it's kind of fun to put, take, you know, take some real world distances and uh, put them into scientific notation. So from LTCC to Golden Gate Park in San Francisco is 997,900 feet. What is that in scientific notation? times 10 to the five. Three digits over to the first comma and then two more feet. And our uncertainty is in that spot, right? I would know not to write those two zeros at the end though. Mm, yeah, then we don't really have a rule for that, do we? That's because this is what's called an ambiguous number, the way it's written up there. Nine, nine, seven, nine, zero, zero feet. That's an ambiguous number. What's ambiguous mean? Come on, everybody's taking their SATs, right? Or get prepping for them. I don't know, are SATs still a thing you guys have to study for? Ambiguous means poorly defined, means unclear. And it is a good SAT word. Another good SAT word means the same thing. I just like really like this word. I think it's underused. Nebulous. Sounds vaguely spacey. Nebulous just means it's cloudy. You don't know what it is. That's not actually going to be on the test or anything. I just like that word. Ambiguous, though, is a word that we use all the time to say that we don't know how many sig figs there are. We don't know where the uncertainty is in this number, right? Because we could assume that this is the last sig fig, but that's making an assumption, right? Because what if it's actually that zero was actually made? What if this is actually plus or minus one? In which case, both of these zeros would count as sig figs. 
in which case we would want to write both of the zeros in our scientific notation as well. So just for the sake of doing practice with, with uh, scientific notation, I put a bunch of ambiguous numbers up there. But in general, this should be a red flag. If you look at it and you don't know where the uncertainty is, then you, you have to assume it's the greatest possible uncertainty, the way the number is written. That's why we stopped at the nine here. We don't know if it's plus or minus 10 or plus or minus one. So we have to assume it's plus or minus 100 because we know for sure that that's a sig fig because it's non-zero. Right? So that was the rule that everybody kind of did um, intuitively. Everybody said, well, when the zeros start, that's when you stop writing digits, right? That's why. It's because this is the last digit that we know was measured. All right, how about kilometers to the nearest star? Turns out it's a long way. Does anybody know what the nearest star is? Okay, the sun, the nearest star that's not the sun. I always forget that one. It's not the North Star. I think it's one of the centuries, Proxima Centuri, because Proxima means close in Latin. Um, although that might be the nearest star that's, that may have a planet capable of supporting life. It may not actually be the nearest star. I forgot if it's Sirius. Sirius might be closer, but less likely to have a planet that, that could develop life. Either one. We have a distance for it. And in scientific notation, we are going to write that zero because we know that zero had to be measured, right? That zero is unambiguous because it's between two other non-zero numbers. Times 10 to the 3, 6, 9, 12, 13. And then what about going the other direction for really small numbers? We do this a lot in chemistry too. A dust mite is 0 0.000305 meters long. We're gonna use the same rule as before, count how many spaces we need to move the decimal. Just remember you have to move the decimal behind the first sig fig. So it's 3.05 times 10 to the minus 4 meters. Three times to get to the first digit, but then you need to get behind the first digit. So you go one spot past that. Um, it's really hard to be able to count on a screen if you don't have things like the commas or... Um, and we don't, by convention, we don't put commas behind the decimal point, right? Um, but what you will see in a lot of science textbooks is they'll either every three digits behind the decimal point, they'll either put a space or an underscore. So that makes it a lot easier to count. It's written as or even smaller, right? 0 0.00000 000 000 000 000 000 000 seven meters, I think is the diameter of a red blood cell ish. So those are just like the commas, you can count by three with the underscores or the spaces, you can count by three going the other direction. Yeah. What would you do if, like, for the second question, there was a one in the one? Would you like to write it in scientific notation? There's like no point of writing it in scientific notation. Oh, if so, like on the math review? Yeah. So the math review was designed to make you think about that and it clearly worked. Yeah, if I say it has to be written in scientific notation, you know, what's, what's 1.7 in scientific notation? It's 1.7 times 10 to the zero. 
Would we ever actually do that in the real world? No, if you just write 1.7. Uh, and same with if it was, you know, 25. Yeah, we can write 25 in scientific notation. It'd be 2.5 times 10 to the one. Typically, we don't do that, though, because the, the only time to write a number this small in scientific notation is to avoid writing an ambiguous number. Because what if I, what if I say we measured, um, I measured, I don't know, your grade, and you got 70 plus or minus one. How do you write 70 plus or minus one in a way that doesn't leave it as an ambiguous number where you know that it's plus or minus one here? You can, either, you can write plus or minus one or you can put it in scientific notation. You can say 7.0 times 10 to the two or sorry, 10, times 10 to the one. That makes it obvious that that zero was a sig fig, right? So that's really the only time to bother with scientific notation with numbers this small, when it's 10 to the one or 10 to the two, is so that you can not write an ambiguous number. Or because you're answering the math review and I want, want to make you think about scientific notation and how it works. The other reason scientific notation is really helpful is the second question here. So the diameter of the sun is 1.39 times 10 to the six kilometers. The diameter, diameter of the earth is 1.27 times 10 to the fourth kilometers. Without looking at a calculator, how much bigger, how many times larger is the sun than the earth? The, in terms of diameter, anyway. How would you do it? Never mind. Any ideas? How would you do it if you did have a calculator? How many times larger? Six, a hundred, who said a hundred? How'd you do it? If I wanna know how many times larger the diameter of the sun is, I would take the larger number and divide by the smaller number, right? Scientific notation makes it really easy to get a decent estimate here because you just look, okay, 10 to the six divided by 10 to the four is 10 to the two. What's 10 to the two? 100. So that's a way we can estimate visually, or not quite visually, but really quickly without needing a calculator. Yeah, the sun's about 100 times larger than the earth in terms of diameter. And it works especially well if your coefficients are really close to each other. But if they're not, you can actually do the division with the coefficients and then do the division with the powers as well. Um, would work pretty well. 1.39 divided by 1.27 is going to be really close to 1, right? They're pretty close to the same number. All right. So... Why do we care about counting sig figs? Because when we're dealing with multiplication division, what do you, when we're adding and subtracting, it makes a lot of sense. You keep the uncertainties the same, the same, right? That's a really kind of intuitive rule. When we're adding and sub, or when we're multiplying and dividing though, that doesn't always work. Because if you have a big uncertainty on one of your numbers and a small uncertainty on the other, the uncertainties compound, right? If you could be off by 10% on one of your numbers and you could be off by 10% on your other number, you're not off by 10% in your answer. You could be off by more than that, right? And so the way we figure out how where to round with multiplication and division is we keep the same number of sig figs as your least certain number, not as your least certain number, as your the number with the fewest sig figs. Right, so, for example, so when we multiply or divide, the product of the calculation 
has the same number of sig figs as the lowest number of sig figs in the calculation. It also doesn't roll off the tongue quite the same way as, as with the uncertainty. Um, plus side is this is an easier rule to follow. It's easier to count sig figs than it is to think about where the uncertainty is sometimes. So if we have a box that's 12 centimeter, 12.10 centimeters by 14.58 centimeters by 3.12 centimeters. <laughs> Say 14.58. And 3.12. What's the volume of the cube? Oh, I wrote cube. It's not technically a cube, right? Somebody who's taken geometry more recently than me. What What is the term for this shape? Shoebox shape. Rectangular prism. More good vocab. So this rectangular prism, we'll just call it a box. Box works well enough though for our terms. Volume is just length times width times height, right? So easy enough to plug it into your calculator. When you cal plug it into your calculator, you get 5.50, sorry, 550.42416. And Units in calculations get treated just like um, variables in algebra. If this was 3.12x times 12.10x plus 14.58x, we'd have x times x times x, right? We'd get x cubed. Units work the same way. When you have centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, you get centimeters cubed. Which, and that also works for addition and subtraction, right? If I said 3.12 centimeters plus 12.10 centimeters, if it was 3.12x plus 12.10x, you would it would still just be x, right? You would come that's just combining like terms, right? So treat the units like they're a variable in math. How do we know we're around here? We look at our three initial numbers and we say, okay. That's four sig figs. This is four sig figs. This is three sig figs. So our answer can only have three sig figs. Which means we have to round to the ones place. Now, how do we write this in a way that's not ambiguous? We want somebody to be able to read our number and know that it's plus or minus one cubic centimeter. We do what? Scientific notation. So 5.50 times 10 to the two cubic centimeters. If you're trying to indicate something is plus or minus one, we do have a bit of a shortcut. It's not technically a, the correct way to write it. Technically, it's still a, an ambiguous number when you do it this way. Um, but it's a good shortcut. If you don't want to write 550 in scientific notation, if you're trying to say that it's plus or minus one in the ones place, you can just write the decimal point with no zeros after it. If we wrote the zeros after it, that would be saying the uncertainty was in that spot, right? So going to the effort of writing the decimal point here is indicating that it's plus or minus one. But again, it's not, that's not technically correct. That's just a common um, shorthand for, for people that work in the sciences or that work with measurements. This would be the more correct way to write it or to write out plus or minus one cubic centimeter. Josie? I will for this one. Um, it doesn't work if you if you want to say that the uncertainty is in the tens place though, right? So if I wanted to say that it was 
500 cubic centimeters plus or minus 10 cubic centimeters. Now you either have to write this out or you have to put it in scientific notation. There's no way around it. So, but occasionally it's helpful. That's one of the reasons why I don't spend a whole lot of time on the decimal point um, because it, it only really works if you're going to the ones place. If you're trying to say any other number, any other digit has the uncertainty, you're gonna have to use scientific notation anyway. Were you guys taught to use the decimal point for the ones place? Is that new or is that new to you? Okay. So at least something here isn't review, right? All right. In formatting on this one. So this is just more practice with units and sig figs. If someone ran 102.1 meters in 10.0 seconds, what's their velocity or their speed rather? 102.1 meters divided by 10.0 seconds. We can do this math on our calculator or probably in your head, hopefully in your head. Everybody can divide by 10 in their head, right? Ten point two one. How many sig figs do we get to keep? Just the three. Four sig figs divided by three sig figs. So we're gonna only keep three sig figs. The other way that conceptually you can think about sig figs is how many sig figs something has determines like you can think of it as what's the percentage of the uncertainty? What percent could I be off? If you have three sig figs, I could be off at most one in this digit, right? Which means I could be off by at most 1% of my total number. If I have four sig figs, I could be off by at, by at most 0.1% of my total number, right? So more sig figs means that the uncertainty is a smaller piece of your total number. So it still comes back to the uncertainty, but we just have a different way of counting the uncertainty when we do addition or when we do the multiplication and division. What do we do with the units in this case? Yeah, if this was, this was uh, X and Y, to put it back in variables, like, like I told you to do. It, you can't simplify that any further, right? So if you can't simplify it any further, you just leave it like that. If it was meters over meters, if it was X over X, you'd be able to cancel out X on top and bottom, right? So we can cancel out units, we can multiply units, but if our units don't match up, then we're just, there's not a whole lot we can do to simplify it. In fact, what the physicists do to simplify units, really complicated units that are made up of lots of things that don't cancel out anymore, is they just give it a new name. Does anybody know what a joule is? We've talked about it in terms of energy, right? Does anybody know the definition of a joule? One, one joule is one kilogram meters times meters squared over seconds squared. That's just, again, doesn't roll off the tongue very well. Nobody wants to write that, that out every single time. So they just said, ah, we're just, we'll call that a joule. Well, now we don't have to. That's not really simplifying the unit. It's just simplifying writing down the unit. Um, but luckily in chemistry, we don't do, have to deal with that all that often. I think there's two labs that we'll do that where we have to use what I, what I call the physics definitions of units to figure out new ways to combine units and get um, to turn you know, things like kilograms into um, Pascals when we start talking about pressure and gases. Um, but I'll walk you through those because this isn't a physics class, at least not on the surface. 
All right, how about 175 pounds divided by 192.4 pounds? How many sig figs is our answer going to keep? Three sig figs. So we have three sig figs divided by four sig figs. And what are our units going to do? They're going to cancel out, or at least the way they're written now. But I told you we're not supposed to write numbers without units, right? So what is this really representing then? First off, what is 175 over 192.4? And how many sig figs are, so if we're gonna keep three sig figs, but our calculator answer looks like that, what are we gonna write down? 910, sorry, nine, yeah, 910. All right, because the five rounds the nine up to a 10. So by, round, by rounding to the nearest 0 0.001, we get 0 0.910. The context is gonna determine what this means. This number doesn't mean anything. A lot of times ratios will do this. Ratios frequently you'll have the same unit on top and bottom, but you need to know what that unit is it's not just that it's pounds, is it pounds of what? If this is, I don't know, uh, total mass, so pounds total, and this is pounds of sand in some mixture. This gives us a ratio where we can say, okay, for every one pound of mixture, 0 0.910 pounds of that are sand but that looks like the units cancel out. So this is basically what a percentage is going to be, right? If we took this and we multiplied by 100, 91.0%, right? So a lot of times percentages are, are not gonna have true units after them. They have to have something though to give it some context because 91% just means 0.91. It doesn't mean anything without extra context. Um, so sometimes that extra context can be percent by mass, percent sand by mass, percent by volume, telling you something about where, where you got that ratio and what it means. Just because you haven't figured this out yet, I, I like, I think, I think words are really interesting in general um, and roots of words and where words come from are really interesting to me. Etymology. Does anybody know what percent means? Not mathematically. What does the word percent mean? Out of a hundred? Yes. Yeah, cent like century or cent like penny. Cent means hundred. Per means what? If you had to, if you had to define, if I said, per hour by divided by yeah i think per if i had to put a redefine per in different words i'd say for every so miles per hour is miles for every hour every hour that you travel you move that many miles percent is for every 100 kind of makes it it's something you already knew how to do probably and kind of understood intuitively. Sometimes with those intuitive things, we need to be able to put them into more explicit context so that we can understand mathematically what to do with it. All right. What if we have a mixture of operations? So adding and subtracting our rounding rules are easy. Multiplying and dividing our rounding rules are easy. How do we know what to do when we have to do both of them? Well, the rule is every time you switch operations, you have to round using that rule before you start your next set of operations that have a different rule. So if you're going to be doing any addition and subtraction before you do multiplication or division, you do your addition or subtraction and round to the right spot. 
and then you do your multiplication and division and round to the right spot. Right. So every time you're going to be if you're going to be switching rounding rules, you have to round before you start the next step. So here's sort of a contrived example of the word problem. The race is run directly towards you and you're timing the runner to determine the average speed. The race starts 152 miles or miles meters from you and ends 7.4 meters from you. The runner takes 25.17 seconds to complete the race. What's the speed in meters per second? Well, speed is change in X divided by change in time, right? Everybody familiar with using triangle delta to represent change? What does delta represent? So it means change when we do that mathematically, what does it represent? How do you find the difference? Or think back to math. When you first learned how to find the slope of a line in algebra one, what's the rule for finding, this? what is a slope in algebra one? Rise over run, right? Or change in Y divided by change in X. How did you actually do the math to do that? Final minus initial, that's what I was looking for. Final minus initial. And our time says it takes 25.17 seconds. That kind of is our change in time, right? We could say 25.17 seconds minus 0, 0.00 seconds, but it's a little unnecessary given the way the problem's written. So I'm just gonna leave it like that. We have our distance and we have our time. So how would we plug this into the calculator and get our rounding right? So final minus initial, I guess we're not, it doesn't really matter if it's final, final minus initial. Um, if we write out this way though, we're gonna wind up with a negative because they're, the runner is moving towards us. So technically that gives them a negative velocity because they're moving towards us. We don't really talk about speed that way though. And again, this isn't a physics class, so I'm just gonna ignore that ne negative sign that, that shows up when we do that. I'm more interested at this point in figuring out how we're going to do our rounding. What's the first math step you would have to plug into your calculator? You have to do this step first, right? It's in parentheses. So what's your, our, our calculator answer is going to be what? How many digits do we get to keep though? Two. So I said digits very carefully, not sig figs. Because this is subtraction, right? Subtraction, we have to do what? You go to the, the least certain number. This is plus or minus a tenth. This is plus or minus one. So our answer is going to be plus or minus one. Now we can do the division part. And now we can keep the same number as sig figs as our worst measurement. So three sig figs versus four sig figs, we're gonna keep three, right? So what's 145 over 25.17? Something just under six? Did I do that right? 25 times four is 100. 25 times six is 150. So something just under six, five point something. And how many sig figs do we get to keep? Just three. All right. So like I said, neither of the rules is that tricky. 
In fact, everybody's, we've done so much practice with each of the rules, everybody's board of tour is doing it. The trick is knowing when to use each of the rules and when to switch over. And you can't switch over between rules unless you do, you finish your rounding for one step before you go to the next step. All right, let's do one more. This one's a little easier to visualize. Uh, I use the dimensions of the classroom that I use, that I teach in frequently at LTCC, but pretend we have a classroom that has these dimensions. It doesn't quite fit here. It's more square than that, but we're gonna go with it anyway. Classroom is 32.5 feet wide and 16.0 feet deep. What is the area of the classroom with the right sig figs? This is even easier than doing the shoebox example, right? Thirty-two point five times sixteen point zero gives us what? Five. What? Five hundred and twenty exactly. I shouldn't have made the numbers so neat. How many sig figs do we get to keep? Three sig figs, right? And what are our units? Feet squared. All right. So then we have this classroom, and they decide they're going to come in and, and install a fume hood in one corner of it. That fume hood is six feet by 1.55 feet. How many square feet are lost to the fume hood now? Six times 1.55, right? So nine point something. Well, 9.3. How many sig figs do we get to keep? Get to keep three sig figs again, right? So it's 9.33. Is that what I heard? Say it loud, right? Like 9.3 even. So how do we say three sig figs? 9.30. Good. Both of those are easy enough. What's the new area of the room? 520 minus 9.30, but now we have now we're doing subtraction and now we switched rules, right? So we had to do our rounding for our multiplication first, and now we're going to subtract 520 plus feet squared or plus or minus one minus 9.30 feet squared. So our final answer has to be plus or minus one as well. So we'll get 511 square feet. All right. How do we feel about this? Ready to move on? Ready for something more interesting maybe? Hopefully. Okay, then let's start using some of these rules. Because once we have some more mathematical tools under our belt, we can actually do some more interesting problems than how many square feet do we have now. So we're going to talk about conversions. Um, and so the, we're going to start with some definitions, though. Anytime we can write that one quantity, meaning a number and a unit, is equal to another quantity, we call that writing inequality. So we can say one meter equals 100 centimeters. That's an equality. Anytime we can say that that's true. It doesn't even, it doesn't have to be something you can find on the conversion sheet. We said, if I said that the, the density of gold is eight, 
18, 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter. I can say one cubic centimeter of gold equals 19.3 grams. That's an equality too. Anytime you can say two things are equal to each other, that's an equality. Where we're there, and there's there's plenty of equalities we can come up with. We've talked about time a little bit the other day, right? When we said 60 seconds is one minute, 60 minutes is we started doing that, um, writing these those equalities out, right? 365.24 days equals one year. That's an equality. Anything on your conversion sheet is going to be an equality. Where this starts getting really useful is we can rearrange these. These equalities are just mathematical equations, right? Which means we can do algebra with them. Once they're an equality, anything we do to one side, we have to do to the other side. But we can kind of do whatever we want. We can say, okay, I'm going to divide both sides by 100 centimeters. What happens on this side, we can't really do any simplifying. But on this side, we can simplify that, right? What do we get when we simplify the right-hand side? One. What's special about one other than it's the loneliest number? All these fans, no. One, no, no, I'm not gonna say one. I thought about it for a second. Um, one is useful in terms of algebra because we can multiply anything by one without changing that number, right? In the commutative property, is it the commutative property? No, the transitive property says that if we can multiply anything by one without changing that number, we can multiply anything that's equal to one times another number without changing that number. So what that's gonna get us is if one meter over 100 centimeters equals one, if I have 525 centimeters, I can multiply that by one still without changing the amount, right? I can also multiply by this because this is equal to one, because the top of the fraction is equal to the bottom of the fraction. If we do that, everybody remembers how to multiply fractions, right? Multiplying fractions was a lot easier than adding and subtracting fractions, right? No lowest common denominator or anything like that. You just multiply across. So when we multiply across, we get, 525 centimeters times meters over 100 centimeters. What happens when we simplify that? What cancels out? Centimeters cancel centimeters, and we get 525 divided by 100. So this is how unit conversions work. We're multiplying by one, and we're just picking what one looks like in a way that's convenient to us. We want to pick that one, and the other term for this is when you rearrange it, a, a, uh, an equality to be equal to one, we call that a conversion factor. So written like this is a is an equality, 365.24 days over one year is a conversion factor. And the only thing that's special about conversion factors is that they're equal to one. The top of the equation of the fraction has to be equal to the bottom of the fraction, which also means we can flip them however we want. As long as the top's equal to the bottom, it doesn't matter what we write on top and what we write on bottom, right? So when we're doing these unit conversions, 
all we're going to do is we're going to set up conversion factors so that the unit we want gone is on top. So we put the unit we want gone on bottom also. And then we just have to have something equal on top. As long as these two are equal, we can do this with whatever we want. We can combine whatever units we want as long as we can say that the top is equal to the bottom. So this is just walking through the same examples or same uh, steps I just did with different numbers. If, we, if we're in meters and we want centimeters, we set up a conversion factor that's got meters and centimeters, and then we rearrange it so that meters is gonna cancel out meters. Point five seven one meters, and when we multiply that times the conversion factor, one meter, hundred centimeters, meters cancels meters. We get point five seven one times one hundred. The only unit left is centimeters. All right, why are we going through this so exhaustively when we pretty much, for the most part, these simply um, conversions, you know how to do these in your head practically, right? If I said 64, 64 inches and I wanna know how many feet that is. Do you have to write it out as a conversion factor to know how to do that? Does everybody know how to do that conversion in your head? I mean, maybe not in your head, but you know how to plug it into your calculator, right? 64 inches into feet. Well, to go from inches to feet, you divide by 12, right? Everybody knows that. Why would we, would we bother writing it out like this? Well, because sometimes it's not going to be as obvious. And if you start by writing out conversions that you already know how to do, if you start by writing them out the long way, not really, it's not even that long, really, it'll make sure you don't put yourself in a position where you multiplied by 12 where you were supposed to divide by 12. Because if you're showing your work, showing the units cancel out, and making sure that you got the, the top is equal to the bottom every time, you're going to be way less likely to mess this up. We know 12 inches equals one foot. We want inches to cancel out. So we're gonna put 12 inches on bottom and one foot on top. Inches cancels inches, 64 divided by 12 when we multiply across. Easy enough, right? Confirms with what we already knew how to do. So we get what, 5.33 repeating? How many sig figs do we get to keep? Two. Let's make that question more interesting. Let's say it's 64.0. Now how many sig figs do we get to keep? Somebody said three, somebody said two. Who said three? Why? because this is exact, right? Exact numbers have infinite sig figs. It's not about 12 inches in a foot, right? It's 12 inches exactly, it's 12.000 out to infinity. If this has infinite sig figs, because it's an exact number, this is gonna determine how, sig how many sig figs we get to keep. All right. Last one. If we want to do 5.33 times 10 to the six inches and we want to know how many miles that is, how do we do it? Inches to feet, feet to miles. We can set it up in two steps, but is there anything saying we can only multiply by one once? So we can do it all in one step, really. We're just going to multiply by one twice. So we can say 5.33 times 10 to the 6 inches. And we can multiply by one. Say, OK, 12 inches on bottom, one foot on top. 
then we can multiply by one again if we have a conversion factor that is feet to miles. Does anybody know what that one is? 5,280 feet equals one mile, right? Doesn't matter if you have them memorized or not. I'm not going to take away your conversion sheet on the test. So you don't have to have it memorized. You just have to know how to use it, which is why I'm going to recommend that you print out the conversion sheet for this class, or we can print some out and give them to you on Monday. Um, use the same conversion sheet because it's the exact same conversion sheet you'll have on the final. If you take notes on it, you won't be able to have your notes on the final but you'll know where to find everything. So you don't need to worry about memorizing things and you won't be thrown off because like, I can't figure out where the conversion for meters to inches is. It's gonna be the same spot it was all quarter, all semester. All right, mathematically what this does, inches cancels inches. We're in feet times miles. Feet cancels feet. Only unit left is miles now, right? So 5.33 times 10 to the six divided by 12 divided by 5,280 gives us our answer, which should be something like something in the hundreds, maybe just 80 something maybe. What do we get for an answer? I know we're almost out of time. All right, you'll have to, I'll leave that as a cliffhanger. You have to do the math yourself if you want an answer. All right, don't forget to take the quiz and turn in your math review if you haven't yet. Get all that done and I'll see everybody on Monday. Have a good weekend.